Here's the Young Turks at Politicon 2018. If you want to catch us every day, become a member, tyt.com slash join. Welcome to the debate between Charlie Kirk and Sam Sater. <laughs> so for those who don't know me, my name is Stephen Olikara. I'm the founder of a nonpartisan organization called the Millennial Action Project. I'm honored to be back at Politicon for the fourth year. And we've got a great debate uh, for all of you discussing the middle class and whether Trump has been helpful or hurtful to the middle class. And we'll debate all of that here. My one request of the panelists is uh, that we want to have an exchange of ideas. And so we want to focus on the substance, avoid personal attacks. And my request on behalf of the audience here uh, is that we don't yell over each other because then they won't be able to understand uh, what you're saying. So are, are we on board with that? Yes. Yes. We do. <laughs> all right. Very good. Are you all ready to get started? Okay, so again, we're here talking about the middle class, and I think perhaps the most consequential piece of legislation that President Trump passed related to this was the tax bill uh, last year. So I'm going to start with Sam. What was your take on the tax bill, and more broadly, do you think uh, Trump has been helpful to the middle class? Well, let me answer your second question first. Um, no. Um, I don't think he's been uh, particularly helpful for the middle class. I don't think that... Um, Across the board, I'm sure there are so, some measures, perhaps, uh, but uh, across the board, net, things are not better for the middle class now, and certainly down the road, they're going to be a lot worse uh, because of policies that we've seen, at least in the first two years of this administration. 65% of the uh, tax cuts went to the top 20% of uh, the country. Um, this was you know, in nominal terms, the biggest tax cut for the middle class um, uh, in history, or at least, uh, you know, recent uh, uh, memory. But at the end of the day, if um, I turn Charlie's microphone up from a 5 to an 8, and mine from a 5 to a 12 or a 10, uh, that is the dynamic that we have going here with incredible wealth inequality. Um, Middle class losing out in terms of uh, wages and versus inflation, certainly at least in the first 18 months of the Trump administration versus the last 18 months of the Obama administration where it was basically flipped. And with increased uh, wealth inequality, you get things like middle class being priced out of the housing market in the top 10 metropolitan areas across the country. Uh, you see it in, in, in other areas as well. Uh, so broadly speaking, at least in terms of the tax cuts, um, it provides some very inefficient stimulus to the economy. But uh, no, this was for the very wealthy. Charlie, your response. Um, I first want to say, Sam, I think you always come about your ideas very thoughtfully. So I look forward to this discussion sincerely. So Me too. Thank you. No. Um, and so... The first thing, I would, I would come from the argument that Trump has helped the middle class. And let me build it out in a couple ways. First of all, you, you did say it was the largest middle class tax cut in recent memory. Now, that's not saying a lot because there hasn't been done a lot for the middle class. But let's define what exactly we mean by the middle class. The middle class, in some ways, is a uniquely American concept. The way that most people would label the middle class, and you could have your own definition, is you have the comfort to send your child to a relatively good school and your child's life has a greater than likelihood chance that will be better than your life. That you have a median income that allows you to live comfortable, that you could take maybe one to two vacations a year, and that you don't have a, to have an insurmountable amount of debt. Now that being said, when Americans are polled, anywhere between 70 to 90 percent of Americans think they're middle class which of course only 50% of Americans are middle class. So that's, it's really amazing to see the, the, the separation of data of how many people think they're middle class versus how many people actually are middle class. The reason that I would say that is, for that is that we have an elevated standard of living in this country that goes beyond just income and goes actually that people that are earning thirty dollars to $40,000 a year have access to higher quality goods that in other countries they wouldn't. But let's talk about the Trump tax cut in particular. First of all, there's a lot of demonization against corporations and against businesses. When businesses thrive, they have to employ people. And so 3.5 million jobs have been created since the start of the Trump administration. Most of those are middle class jobs. Wages have gone up about 3.8% in the last year. 
They were flatlining under the Obama presidency. My favorite number. Wait, I'm sorry. Well, that's not true. Uh, Excuse me? Hey, oh, you, hey hold on. I, Sam, I'm running the panel here. You can't here. do what you just did. <laughs> Excuse me. Well, but I'm not going to sit here Sam, and have lies about facts. Right. Everybody has a phone. Google, Google middle class wages. So, see if they're stagnant versus inflation. So 3.8% wage increase over the last year for the median worker. Hispanic income is at its highest level in American history at $50,000 a year. My favorite number of the Trump administration is that 3.9 million people have gone off food stamps and into the labor force. 3.9 million people. Now, now, why is that my favorite number? For us conservatives, we do not judge success by how many people go on government programs, but instead of how many people go off into independence. Now, I will not say that our economy is at its optimal level. I think it's the best economy in a generation. You would look at a 4.2% GDP growth, 3.7% unemployment rate. And so if you judge the middle class by two major things, which is standard of living increase, of which you're seeing that happen dramatically, and the second of which is education. We have a lot of work to do on the education side. I think you and I would both agree on that. We could have an extended conversation about that on policy. But the economic metrics are so good that the New York Times says, quote, this economy is so good, we're running out of ways to critique it. And so, again, it's not a perfect economy, but for middle class Americans that care about rising wages, creating jobs, and tax cuts, the average American family had a $2,700 tax cut under this Trump tax cut. That's good for, that's good for consumer, consumer spending power, that's good for savings, and it's good for, of course, what you would say is more demand-side economics, coupled with supply-side economics that created jobs and repatriated trillions of dollars of wealth back to America. So everyone here has a phone, and they can Google the first 18 months of the Trump administration versus the last 18 months of the Obama administration. Wages have gone up 1.7%. Under uh, the, the, la the first 18 months of the Trump administration, they ha uh, inflation is up 3.8%. That is simply a fact. Now, if you, if, you narrow, if you narrow the time horizon, you can come up with numbers you're talking about. And this is why people have to be careful about statistics, because I can come up here and manipulate anything. Yes, uh, Latino uh, wages are up. In fact, the middle class is making more money today than in uh, $61,000 uh, than in the past. However, like I say, inflation is up. The cost of higher education has gone up 110% since 1994. So it doesn't matter if the middle class is making $61,000 if to lead the middle class life that you were talking about is that much more expensive. If the middle class liked the tax cuts, they wouldn't uh, disfavor them far greater than they do even Obamacare at this point, right? I mean, so I the bottom line is we can throw out statistics, but if they're not contextualized, it doesn't matter. Okay, so Everyone knows the tax cuts went to the wealthy. Am I demonizing them? No. The point is that they have an inordinate amount of wealth and income in this country, and it turns into political power. And I know you have a problem with that. And the way to solve that is to uh, flatten the tax, uh, is to not give them tax cuts and more power, and give corporations more power and cash to pay off their, their shareholders, which tend to be the board of directors and the CEOs, but rather to spread the wealth. So, okay. There, there are some things I agreed with. However, to contextualize it further, it doesn't make the economic growth, the e economic success, any less exceptional or any less historic because... It's following the same no, trajectory no, no, but as the however, Obama administration. Hold, no, hold on a it goes like this. Okay, so... For, he hasn't screwed it up. S Sam, hold Sam, I, 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 I routinely restrain myself during your comments to allow you... Thank to you for that, Charlie. And that's a big deal for me, if you watched yesterday. Feel free to interrupt me when you, when you think I've said something wrong. If that... that you heard it. Everyone heard it. Okay. So uh, well, let, let's, I want to walk through a couple points there. The first of all, the, the big misconception that I have with your original analysis is that just because someone gets rich, someone got poor. That is categorically false. If, if, if a wealthy person increases their net worth, they did not exploit someone to get wealthier. They had to take a risk, employ a bunch of people, buy a building, 
have a really good idea and people had to continue to buy that, those products over and over again. And, and, and you and I will have a philosophical and economic difference in this. I come from a perspective that does not believe in the zero-sum game and does not believe in the fixed pie fallacy. Instead, I believe that when someone gets richer, they must employ an extraordinary amount of people. They had to take a huge risk. They had a higher than likelihood chance not to succeed. They probably borrowed money and then they had to create something that all of us had to buy over and over and over again. That inherently allows the standard of living to increase for all people, prices to usually go down, and then you enter competition. It's very, very difficult to do that time and time again, and you see in market-based economies, you have to have really, really good ideas for a long period of time to accumulate that kind of wealth. With that being said, those that get wealthy because of access to power such as eight out of the 10 wealthiest counties in America around Washington, DC, they're not actually creating anything that I would consider to be of value to, to the middle class because they're, it, they're being rewarded to their geographic proximity to a $4.4 trillion federal budget that is extracting money away from middle class Americans. Those are the lobbyists, those are the trial lawyers, those are the people working for the corporations that are lobbying not on behalf of middle America, but on behalf of people around Washington, DC. So in that, you and I will agree well, okay, the, the people who live in that, the, the, the counties you're talking about are overwhelmingly um, uh, arms sales and military industrial complex people. I'm not the defending The Trump administration that, raised the budget that of the I military don't, I don't agree by $700 billion over the next 10 okay, years. But, but Sam, that money is flowing into those people. Is that I, right I, or wrong? I don't agree with that, though, so I will I have okay. a consensus well, that we should. Okay, but my point should... is Donald Trump is the one who is leading okay, that but, extraction so of wealth. Okay, first of all. But let me finish. Didn't you say I can interrupt you if you said if something? If I said something wrong. Yes, so it's only $700 billion of our budget every single year. Is to, what, what's the rest? It's to entitlements. It is to the federal bureaucracies. To those, how about the government contracts for housing and urban development? Okay. The government contracts for health and human services. Well, you were talking what about, about the government counties. contracts? Yeah. So those, those counties, counties that get the government contracts outside of the defense contracts are right. also what I right. put my critique on. Minuscule. The three point two trillion the dollars is not minuscule. The the non. It's a made up number. Let's talk Kansas for a moment, shall we? Because. Okay. You can talk about what a small business does for employment. I'm a small businessman, and I understand what small business does. In Kansas, if I had been living in Kansas, I would have gotten a huge, huge uh, tax break because huge. I'm an S-Corp. <laughs> huge. Uh, under Sam Brownback back in 2012. He brought in Arthur Laffer, who I'm sure you're familiar with, is okay. the god for folks like you in many respects. The idea being, if we cut taxes on the wealthy, they will spread this wealth, it will trickle down on all of us. It will, it will shower down on us, right? It will rain upon us. <laughs> and we will all be sprinkled with this, this golden shower, if you will. <laughs> and, and the economy will explode. And people will have jobs, and everything will work out. In fact, revenue will go up. That's what Mitch McConnell told us after this tax cut, too. And what happened in Kansas was a disaster. It was such an unmitigated disaster. Not only did it destroy Kansas's educational system, uh, the Republican-controlled state house rose taxes four years later because their economic growth lagged, their employment lagged, and then Sam Brownback was literally made ambassador to, like, ether. Right? He's like the ambassador to religion now. He's been jettisoned into the atmosphere in some way because that is the perfect example of the Republican conservative philosophy, and it failed. And we know that it's okay. failing now on so a national can, level. Can I chip in here? Because Mitch McConnell made the same promise about the deficit. In fact, Larry Kudlow, the chief economic advisor of the president, made this same promise in July. So, and we now have a deficit that is twice the size it was when Obama left office. And now Mitch McConnell wants to cut Medicare and Social Security again, let me, because of those taxes. You're, you're, you're not, you're not going to hear me. Yeah. You're not going to hear me defend federal deficits or our exploding national debt. Quick fact, Barack Obama added more debt than any other president in U.S. history. He Do the you debt. defend? What, but Do you defend these tax so cuts that have doubled the deficit? 
so, so the tax cuts should have been coupled with spending cuts. However, we have explosive economic growth. We have more people in the labor force than ever That's before. revenue coming in. We have trillions of dollars repatriating back to America. Let, let me finish. I allowed you to have your Kansas example. Now that we're talking about states, let's talk about the juxtaposition of the failed state of California with the successful state of Texas. And, and, and I think I, I, want, I want a country that's going to look a lot more like Florida and Texas and a lot less like Illinois and California. Now, what have states like Illinois and California done? Well, they're losing citizens, number one. They're losing job creators. They're losing entrepreneurs because they have raised taxes. They have reckless politicians in both states like Illinois and California. What have Texas and Florida done? They've kept their taxes low. Both have no state income tax. They have deregulated their economies, and Sam would even agree with that. Texas, during the Great, during the great Recession, 2008, 2009, 2010, comprised one out of three of all jobs created across the country. And, and if you couple that with, if you, if you juxtapose that, if you will, with Illinois, that in the Midwest, the Midwest is booming except Illinois. Every state in the Midwest has a 3% GDP growth. Illinois has a 1.8% GDP growth, despite Chicago being an exceptional city that's being screwed up by corrupt politicians and one political party. And you look at California, that should be the most prosperous, that should be the richest state in the country. And yes, you'll say, okay, you'll say it is the richest country. It also is the most populous country with the most amount of homeless people, with the most amount of people living in poverty, with crumbling schools. Let me finish, Sam. I, I know you got plenty of differences, but as long as you want to, if you want to talk about states, allow me to address the Kansas example. When, Kansas, if you, if, you, if you look at Kansas versus a state like Connecticut, Kansas had higher economic growth and was creating more jobs versus similar size, similar population blue states during the brownback tax cuts. There are a lot of other contributing factors to why Kansas was not exactly a pristine example of how to run a state, such as government corruption, such as misallocation of resources, and, a, and, and other diminishing businesses that went to states like Texas that had a zero, zero state income tax. And so if you want to talk about the contrast to states, it's the red states that are rate nine out of 10 of the most pro-business states in America have Republican governors and Republican legislatures. The, so, the most pro-growth okay. states in America are run by Republicans. I'm so, glad you mentioned it though. The reason why I bring up Kansas is because the dynamic is identical to the one that Donald Trump, this is what we're talking about, okay. that Donald Trump and the Republicans did on a national level. Now, here's how the game works, and this is why it is zero sum. Because you give these massive tax cuts to the wealthy, and you repatriate money from overseas uh, that ends up going into shareholder buybacks, to stock buybacks, we know that 84%, 84% of stocks in this country are owned by the top 10%. Th this is a great point. I want to and okay, Great. And 60% of those, those tax dollars that were repatriated went into the hands of those people. We saw no job growth as a function of that repatriation. We saw no, uh, uh, no, none of the trickle down that we're supposed to see. We see these tax cuts and then Mitch McConnell brings down the hammer. We're gonna cut Social Security, we're gonna cut Medicare. These are the most popular, the most successful programs in the country and the only way the Republicans can cut them is to create an economic crisis, and that is by giving money to wealthy people. Okay, so let's talk about the, the, stock, the stock buyback. So let's talk about the stock buyback. Um, so you say 84%. What that doesn't contextualize, to use your word, is money managers that are controlling money for pension funds. So that it's, does it's, include no, it doesn't. pension funds. It, Sam, it does 401k. not. Sam, it does not. Look it Goldman up, Sachs Sam. controls money Look for the up. California State Pension Fund. It's categorized as Goldman Sachs controlling that money, not as the pension fund. So when the stock market goes up, the teachers, the firefighters, the police officers, their 401ks go up, their pensions go up, and their net worth goes up. So when it the stock market explodes, the net. Sam, I allowed you to pension. finish. You're lying. Okay, so what, what's a, no, no, no. So, so when, when a money Google manager, for, for example, when, when, when GCTR partners from Chicago, Sam, answer the question. When Goldman Sachs controls the California State Pension Fund, is it classified as the California State Pension Fund buying the securities or Goldman Sachs buying the securities? It, Goldman Sachs. So when you use, the, you, you know that's true. 84% of 
I will tell you what the number is. Oh, okay. Google it. I, again, so 84% you, your number of is stocks correct. In this country, However, to add context to it, Sam, is that the money manager is in the 1%, but the money they're managing is pension fund money that are people in the middle class. So, you're, class so what you're yeah. saying is not incorrect, no. No. but it's only half true because no. it is the middle class people's money that they're managing. With that being said, what, so again, when let's use an example zero zero evidence that repatriation created any jobs i'll use a microcosm example how about foxconn that created 4000 jobs in wisconsin because they repatriated the money away from chinese manufacturing jobs to american manufacturing jobs 4000 new jobs were created in wisconsin because of the trump tax cut that they directly attributed to a pro business pro american mindset that's 4000 jobs in wisconsin that otherwise did not exist exist under a republican governor republican state legislature and a president now that's a microcosm some example, you said there's zero evidence. That's a piece of evidence. Well, look, people can look at the last time a Republican president repatriated that money. It was the American Jobs Creation Act, 2005. George Bush promoted this. He has come out and, and subsequently said that he got rolled because all those companies that wanted that to supposedly uh, add jobs cut jobs. We know the, these money went to buybacks. We know why buybacks are legal now because of the Republican Party uh, changed that regulation in the 80s when it used to be called stock manipulation. And we know that it benefits the CEOs and the shareholders and that 84 percent. And it, it does not. It includes the California pensions. It includes every municipal and state pension and 401k in the country. Thank you. Hey, sir. So, but here, here's another thing I, I do want to talk about because you talk about, can you, can you explain to me when someone gets richer, who exactly gets poorer? Can you explain how that process works? Like when, like for example, when, when I'll you, explain to you. So, so who gets, you know, folks, you understand the idea of buying power, right? If I give you ma'am $10 and school costs $10, you buy a school. But if school goes up to $20, then you don't have the same buying power. What drives the price of, let's say, housing, for instance? It is wealth inequality. And you see this in 10 cities across the country, the biggest metropolitan areas in the country. The middle class cannot afford to live there anymore because we have real estate so, going through the roof. You're right. And so you have, you have in states such as Illinois and Connecticut and California, because of excessive property taxes, people don't want to purchase some of those houses. So you have, you, have one of two, you have one of two problems that happen, is that the middle class gets priced out. So, so, so the wealthy, if you will, the people that you are demonizing, will go up a bracket and they'll say, well, if, I, if I'm going to pay $35,000 a year in property taxes, I might as well buy this XYZ house. Therefore, the middle class person who's trying to sell their house with an excessive property tax burden has to, has to property taxes are one of the main reasons. I'm a homeowner. Why. I know what taxes are. And right. they're not nearly as much as if the price goes up. Again, so in states like Illinois, Property taxes can be anywhere between six and a half to nine percent for a state that doesn't work for schools that schools are completely and totally broken. So, but like, let's you, the for, the foreign investment thing. So, I'm still trying to get back. Let me go back to the zero sum game. When an entrepreneur renders a service and employs a bunch of people, and you buy that service, who is getting poorer in that transaction? Because you said zero sum game. I, I'm trying to understand I'm in, in a market about economy. Tax cuts. No, you're right. So, tax cut where an average middle class family had a $2,700 tax cut, where you have the corporate rate that went from 35% effective, I understand a lot of corporations did not pay that, they use loopholes, of which I disagree with completely, went down to 20% 20, 20 effective in January, and they used that money to invest in capital infrastructure, or they repatriate Stock the buybacks. So, so They're using the money not, to buy not, not exclusively, so, let, so stock buybacks. How about companies where the actual employees own the stock? And their, and their own net worth goes up. Aren't they part of the middle class? I am sure there are some members of the middle class who benefited from the, start, uh, the tax cut. That, that's, that, that's what I'm saying, Sam. the overwhelming thrust of the tax cuts goes in to the wealthiest pockets via either stock buybacks or through capital gains or through having an S-corp and getting and paying less in taxes. So look, we could cherry pick things. You can say Illinois. I could say the, the worst 16 
the, the, the lowest 15 states in the country in terms of education are all uh, run by Republican governors, except for Louisiana, which had Bobby Jindal for uh, eight years up until 2016. But cherry picking doesn't work. You wouldn't. Well, there's I was a gonna, lot of things. The, the about idea of zero sum game, though, the zero sum game. You wouldn't like me to cherry pick. Th that's why I was trying to get anything. to the philosophical difference because I don't believe when someone gets rich, someone inherently well, you can gets talk more philosophy, poor. Philosophy, but we don't need to. But that, we have data. Okay, but the da data. Right. So the data. Fine, Sam. If you want to talk data, and Charlie, yeah. I'm going to give you the last word on this. Yeah, one. but I mean, so again, I, I was thinking maybe because again, you were just talking about cherry picking and then you were cherry picking and I was trying to talk about philosophy which is I don't believe in a zero sum game I believe in a market economy when you trade e both parties equally get richer when you trade and standard living goes up prices go down and you have abundance you have an abundance problem not a scarcity problem in the west but l l so just I, I'm trying to maybe maybe I'm failing to understand how because the, the left seems so adamantly opposed to the policies that have delivered us a 4.2% GDP rate, the lowest ever black unemployment rate, the lowest ever Asian American unemployment rate, the lowest Hispanic unemployment rate, the lowest veterans unemployment since 2001, a $2,700 average middle class tax cut, and, and the economy is so good Obama's trying to take credit for it. And so, but Sam, I, can you give some credence to the idea that when you have, when you, when you lessen government burden, you couple that with a massive deregulation, the largest deregulation agenda in a hundred years. Is there, is there, are you willing to give an inch to say that maybe something Trump has done has benefited the well-being of people in the middle class? All right. Well, you keep repeating the same thing, and I keep explaining. And it, it. doesn't make it less true, Sam. Well, it makes it. I'm explaining to you why it's irrelevant, because That's yes, true. there has been a trajectory where we have seen all of the uh, unemployment gains that you've talked about. We have seen stagnant wages. That is a fact. The buying power of the middle class has dropped. You talk about rolling back regulations. Let's talk about that. Yeah, that's good. Let's talk, about Let's talk about that. I'm glad. I want you to name three regulations that, uh, that have been rolled back that have helped the middle class. And I'll name three that have hurt the middle class. Um, how about rolling back Obama's war on coal? Okay. That has created hundreds of thousands of jobs throughout Appalachia and brought down utility costs Excuse in over 30 states. Me. What? Yes. So, so the this people is people laughing in the front. I, are from West I, 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 I smile and I and I'm happy when the people of West Virginia actually have jobs. Unlike what Hillary Clinton said, we're going to destroy all your jobs and we're going to find another way to give you meaning. That's one. And, and also, if you go through the EPA agenda, there was a specific regulation under the Obama era that categorized lakes and tributaries in the backyards of certain farmers as oil spills. That's number two. And number I'm sorry, th wait, walk us through this by saying you can't yes, dump. Yes, Sam, Sam, chemicals. being condescending about a fact does not make it any less true. So under the Obama era. Well, wait a second. I'm just asking you, walk us through yes, so how... The having farmers dump pesticides in tributaries. Okay, that's not what I said. The they, they classified lakes and tributaries in the backyards of certain farms as oil spills, which is a complete miscategorization and abuse of the Clean Water Act of 1976. So that was a that was a abuse of power under what I like to call the Employment Prevention Agency. And how many or jobs do you the Environmental Protection Agency that were created by that? Well, it definitely saved all these farmers hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal costs and the fact that they can still be operating. Would you like more regulations, Sam? How about, One more. How about the, th the thousands of consumer regulations that were finally rolled back under the Consumer Finance Financial Protection Bureau so that we do not have to go through excessive amount of regulation to get small business loans? Happy to defend that any single day. I'm happy to defend the deregulatory agenda of, Ob of Trump against the excessive regulatory agenda of Obama. So there, there's three. First off, First off, the, all right, so first off, let's just start with this. Donald Trump has not rolled back that many regulations. That's the reality. The rate in which our regulations have grown has definitely been slowed. He's done about half of new regulations that Obama and Bush did up to this point. That is true. But let's talk first about the uh, regulation that you mentioned in terms of uh, the coal-fired oh. power plants. 
This will cause 3,600 deaths, 90,000 cases of asthma, 1,700 heart attacks. The expenses associated with this are in the hundreds of millions of dollars. The mercury and air toxins rollback will cause 11,000 deaths annually. The asbestos rollbacks will cost four, up to 40,000 annual deaths. The EPA, the Trump EPA, says that for every one regulation, one dollar's worth of regulation that costs an industry or whatnot, $14 of economic growth are, are, are generated. What's an example of that? Light bulbs. For years, conservatives were angry about light bulbs. I don't know if people here are old enough to remember this. But the idea that the U.S. government would require more efficient light bulbs was the, the loss of liberty in a, to a scope that we can't even imagine. What has happened is consumers have saved tens of millions of dollars because they don't have to replace these incandescent light bulbs. Um, we've seen in terms of... In terms of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau saved consumers $90 million worth of bank fees in the last year of the Obama administration alone. There okay. has not been so one, there has not been one enforcement action since the Trump administration has taken over. So, so what's the CFPB budget? What is the budget? It is completely funded by fees that they get from the bank. Not oh, one. Oh, okay, so so forcibly take money away from the people that are depositor and then say that they're saving ninety million dollars of fees on the back. End. That's not the way it works. No, so what, when you deposit your money. So so the banks money. make money by people putting money in it and then they borrow it out. So those are depositors. So you're taxing the depositors to then put on the back end of a government agency that is run in a... And the CFPB should com be completely abolished. It's an unconstitutional agency. And it, it, it's, it's, Banking, it's used as a weapon. Bankers do not loan out their depositors' money exclusively. That's why you have capital controls. They loan but out a lot Exclusively. That is one form and function of a bank. But it goes back to you. Well... Obviously, goes back to you know most of the money in your bank's actually not in there, Sam. You know that, yes. right? Okay, that that's the way a bank works. So you have the you have the FDIC that insures it up to a certain amount, but that money is probably somewhere else in the economy on loan or on lien to somewhere else to try to make the bank money. So when you're taxing the bank to try to fund the CFPB, you're actually taxing the depositors. You're yet you are you are taxing the money within the bank. The bank is compri comprised of the people that put the money in the bank. No, you're taxing the profits they make off of their loan. And, 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 and they make... So, so let, let's talk about banking. So first of all, they make money well, off let's of... let's stay with regulation. Okay, Sam, they make, they, make money, they make money off of most of the money that banks used to make until Dodd-Frank was off lending to small businesses and local communities, but Dodd-Frank completely ob obliterated the idea of the local community bank. We have seen a, ch a sharp decline in community banks. We have not seen a sharp decline have... in community banks unless you look over the, the past 30 years where we have seen a precipitous decline in those banks because of mergers and acquisitions. Right. So we, we've saw it. I will repeat myself because it's, it's correct. Since, 2000, since the financial crisis, Dodd-Frank was a weapon used against small community banks that has hundreds of millions of dollars of regulation that put on small and local community banks. You know who loves Dodd-Frank? You know who's lobbying against the repeal of Dodd-Frank? Something that you and I can agree with. Government Sachs. I mean, Goldman Sachs, which completely own... The, the, the Treasury Department, in both administrations, by the way, whether it be the Bush administration, the Obama administration, or the Trump administration, Government Sachs has an inside-out access to, our, to, the, to the Treasury Department. They are lobbying against a repeal of Dodd-Frank. Now, why would that possibly be? Because Dodd-Frank is used as a hedge against small and community banks to protect the Wells Fargo's of the world, the J.P. Morgan Chase's, and the Goldman Sachs. And so they All use right. regulation as a competitive edge. Will you join me edge. in calling for a 21st century uh, Glass-Steagall Act? I, right. We can deal with government. We can deal with government. I, 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 I would. I would actually. I'll, I'll I think we should get rid of the carried interest deduction. I think you and I could agree on that. That's completely different from what I've just no. asked. You. Well, it's it's actually it's a component of what no. many people on your say. No, a I will not. I will not join you in a 21st century Glass Steagall Act. No. Why? All right, hold on, guys. I want. We're about. If to you want to cut down on the power of the big banks, why wouldn't you? 
Well, okay, so you would. But if you're want, sincere, no, no, walk, why wouldn't walk you me want through, walk the me one through way would... that would actually cut in to the size and the power of those banks? Because it wouldn't do that. Because every single time you try to penalize the power of Wall Street, every single time you try to use government to go after the people that have the power, the exact opposite happens. You have an oligarchic class that is created around Washington, D.C., and the biggest companies get more powerful, and it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it totally pushes out competition. You mentioned the Whether, financial crisis. The financial crisis let's talk is about a product that. of the rollback of Glass-Steagall okay, that, during I'm, the Clinton administration. Incorrect. I'll let you take you, do your case of why you think 2008 happened, and it, I'll tell you what really happened. Well, <laughs> it was not the cause of 2008 of the initial crisis. It was the cause of the severity of the crisis because we allowed commercial banks and investor banks to commingle. And they were too big to fail, and it almost pulled our entire financial system under. And so you return to a day which existed pre-96, uh, where these banks cannot commingle. If one of them fails, it's a problem, but it's not one that is going to throw our entire economy into jeopardy. That is why the debt increased during Obama years, because the economy fell off a cliff. And so if you want to diminish the power of Goldman Sachs and of Citibank and Wells Fargo, and we can agree on this, let's call for a 21st century Glass-Steagall Act. We can do something bipartisan. This will be great. And we can actually diminish the power of these banks. So I, I, I will say there, you'd actually find more, you'd find more acceptance of that argument in me than most people because I think there, was, there, there is some merit to the argument that the repeal of Glass-Steagall did open up the reckless behavior of banks. However, I would say it played, in talking about 2008, it, did not, it was not the primary factor nor the secondary factor of why that financial crisis was created. It was first and foremost, Fannie and Freddie, which is a government-sponsored institution that has yet to be held accountable, that has never showed their books to the taxpayers, triple A bond rating, crap. Triple A bond rating mortgages where people had FICO credit scores that were beyond F, that had median income around $35,000 a year, never actually visiting the houses that were, they were giving the mortgages to. It was B and B minus loans that they were looping together with AAA bond rating, and they were in bed with the rating agencies. So I think Sam and I would agree that there was, there was widespread collusion. Fannie and Freddie is not Wall Street. It is a government institution that, that, that Congress sanctioned yet, yet to be hold Fannie, them accountable. They Fannie are a, and Freddie, uh, they are a you're right. I mean, it, it's, it's, a, government. it's a quasi-government function, but it's enough. But... Fannie and Freddie entered into that subprime market four years after all the major banks did. No, right, Believe right. me, but Sam, you were in high school at this Sam, time. I can assure Sam, let you. let me finish. I, I, I paid attention to this. Now, Can, listen, can I finish the point? Well, are you the gonna point argue, is are you gonna continue to argue the from banks authority? gave bad loans. We need more right. regulation so, so, so they uphold their fiduciary duty. Okay, so let's... I, I want. I want to. I want to finish the point on the financial crisis. You couple that. I want to get to trade and okay. tariffs after that. The, the Community Reinvestment Act, which incentivized these banks to give loans to low-income communities. The Community Reinvestment Act. You can read the actual language of the bill. Had quotas for banks over a certain level to give these loans out. You cu you, you triple that with Alan Greenspan artificially lowering interest rates after 9/11. So you had cheap money fl flowing all around, and all of a sudden people said, oh, you can't question the housing market. It's as stable as can be. When you looked at the mortgages that Fannie and Freddie were AAA rating, a government agency, the banks were trading Fannie off the cut. Fannie and Freddie no, did the, the not banks do the ratings. Were, Sam, the ratings were the, by three agencies Sam, that were not government agencies. Sam, Moody, Fannie and Freddie, the banks were trading agencies. off the confidence that Fannie and Freddie gave them because they, because they said, oh, but Fannie and Freddie is trading it. Oh, my goodness, we could trade it. So then Goldman Sachs never actually looked through the mortgages because they, first and foremost, they were incentivized to do it. They had the cheap money from the government. And finally, they had the confidence and the conviction, which was all false, by a government agency to trade on these loans to destabilize our economy. Now, right. the bankers that lied, like Listen. the Wells Fargo's executives that lied, they should be in prison. You Listen. and I agree on that. If there, was a, if there was a scrawl underneath here, it would be really embarrassing for you because everyone who knows anything about banking knows that there were three rating agencies. Their names were not Fannie Mae and not Freddie Mac. I never said Their they were a rating agency. They were trading them as AAA bond rated. And they, they were, were, they, they were set these rated are, them? They, they were rated by the three rating agencies. Right. Are those agencies government agencies? So what did Fannie and Freddie issue yes to or no. JP Morgan? Yes or no. They are not government agencies. That's independent. Right. They're, They're not. independently governed. Hold on. Oh. Who is supposed to regulate them?
Sam, hold on a second. Who is supposed to regulate them? Did, did the SEC do their job in regulating them? No. Part of Dodd Frank. I thought the SEC was supposed to keep us safe. You're trying to—it's the biggest you. government failure of the modern era. The SEC that has a thirty billion dollar budget every single Part year did not even walk into these rating agencies and say, "Show me these mortgages. Show me the FICO scores. Show me how they're eighteen Part months delinquent." Part of Dodd Frank. If you're arguing that regulators were not on the ball. You and I agree. There should be stricter regulation. I'm arguing that's what happens when you continue to add these layers and layers so, of regulation, so, and then you blame capitalism okay. for it. You're like, oh, you have all these regulators that, are, that used to work at Goldman. They used to work at Credit Suisse. They used to work at Wells Fargo. They go work for Fannie and Freddie. They go work for the regulators. Right. They say, oh, you know, it's just a failure of capitalism despite government being so, the one AAA bond rating. I understand you, the failure of regulation to regulate the capitalists who... Uh, who gambled with with money that was uh, putting our our entire economy in jeopardy? The failure of those regulators to do their job. The answer to that is to have no regulation and just let it be complete wireless. So I know. First of all, Dodd Frank does the exact opposite of it. Number one. Number two. The answer. Dodd is not Frank that. tried so, to regulate. So first of all, you know what the solution those three is, Sam. I'm so I'm so glad you asked. Pay. You want to know what the solution but, is? The solution listen, is we should have let the banks the, fail and make them pay a price for gambling with our money. That's the solution. Because they won't do it again, Sam. If you bail them out and you give the Wall Street executives huge bonuses and, they, and the, one, the Wells Fargo executives should be in prison. You and I agree with that. Yes. They gambled with our yes. money. Yes. But you don't have recourse. You don't have punishment. They're going to do it again. Yes, I agree. There's, if you don't uh, punish them, they'll do it again. Or if you let them have the regulatory space to do it again, they'll do it again. No, so that, that's so, where you and I disagree. It wasn't the regulatory space. It was Fannie and Freddie that paved the way. They were the ones that they were the number one distri distributor that's of these true. falsely labeled AAA bonds. They never actually saw the mortgages they were trading. You Fannie and Freddie to this day, has, no. they've never opened their books. Okay. They, we fund them, and they have All never right. opened their books. We do not. Listen, the bottom line is the reason why... We had such a severe crisis was because of the relationship between the commercial banks and the investment banks. Fannie and Freddie bought those mortgages from those banks four years after the run started. I agree with you that you have some of the elements correct. You don't understand the role of Fannie and Freddie in that crisis, but it's largely irrelevant to the point I'm making, which is... The crisis was as severe as it was because we rescinded Glass-Siegel under a Democratic president and a Republican Congress. We could go back and we could, uh, today, we could reinstitute it and save the banks. A guy like Steve I, I Mnuchin, some I agree with I you. Think some he should be in jail. Uh, okay, he well, did this stuff. We I'm not going to talk to Steve personally, but I think where we could agree, where Sam and I agree is there's something fundamentally wrong that somehow a prerequisite to run the Treasury Department is working at Goldman Sachs. There's something wrong with that. And, and, and that, that is cronyism, not capitalism. Now, Sam will say, well, that's what happens when you allow capitalism. I would completely and totally Well, when you agree. have corporations gain so much money and power, okay, okay. they're too big. And but, we need to make them small. I, I had four seconds of an agreement moment, so I want you all to remember. How does the, market, for that. How does the market make these entities that have too much power smaller? Competition. Because, because you know why? It, it, the, Who's keeping someone from competing with Amazon? Who's keeping someone from competing with Google? Oh, okay, so I'm glad who's you asked. Who's keeping someone? No, nobody, but you know who's keeping the them from, you know, you know who's trying to compete, who's pre preventing them from keeping to, to prevent against Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan? The Dodd Frank bill, because it has so much regulation and, so, and such cumbersome rules, it disallows the local community bank from ever competing against them. The local community bank is going to compete against Do uh, uh, Goldman Sachs? Oh, wait, hold on. I'm so glad They've you have been bought. Oh, that, that's a great question. Sachs where did these banks city. start from, them, Sam? Where, where, where did Wells Fargo start? Yeah. It started as a local community bank community bank that eventually did a very good job of running their balance sheets and then they became one of the Wall Street banks. It's not, it's not unheard of that when something... When there was no Dodd-Frank. Exactly right. It was before Dodd-Frank, right. Sam. Right. And they were not allowed to have 
to merge until that 96. No, I, again, I think there is some merit to your Glass-Steagall argument. I do not think that is the primary factor why 2008 happened, nor would I say that reinst reinstating Glass-Steagall will have competition back on Wall Street. We will get competition back on Wall Street when we decentralize the SEC, when we de decentralize the FDIC, we make it easier for people to give out loans and have, a, and, and have FDIC deposit insurance backing. That is so hard to do right now because the, Goldman Sachs doesn't want that competition. It's very simple. When you have someone from Goldman Sachs running the Treasury Department that will probably work for Goldman Sachs after and they worked for them before, they're going to try to protect Goldman Sachs' interests. What does that look like? Create rules and regulation that make it very hard for other banks to compete with Goldman Sachs. You and I agree with that. We, just have we to agree that the middle class is suffering for Trump's continuing to allow Goldman Sachs in there. Maybe we should both vote for Bernie Sanders. Well, so Elizabeth Warren. And and again, it's important to, to remember, it's, it's not just a Republican or, or Democrat thing. Both parties allow Goldman Sachs to run the Treasury Department. But let me say this. Elizabeth I, Warren and Bernie Sanders definitively would. Well, she, I, might, she might one 1,024th allow it to be run, but do we, one 1,024th the okay. Treasury Department might be run by someone from Goldman Sachs. So while we still have a little bit of time, I want to make sure we talk about trade and tariffs. I suspect there might be some agreement, some disagreement here. I'll start with Charlie. Give us your take on Trump's trade policy, his tariffs um, that have had a big impact, particularly in the Midwest. Uh, do you agree with it, disagree, tell us your take. I, I, have a, I have a more nuanced opinion on it. I think what he's doing with China is terrific. I think China has been, has been an unfair actor on the, on, the world, on the world stage for far too long. They still are categorized as a developing nation in the World Trade Organization, which allows them access to subsidies um, they're allowed, they're, they build a coal-fired power plant every single month, which as soon as they exit as a developing nation um, under that certification, it would be much more difficult to do that. Sam and I might actually agree on that. Um, and look, China steals our IP. So the way it works in China is if you want to trade with them, you have to essentially form a partnership with the government. They'll copy your good or service, and then they'll sell it back into the market that you're competing in probably quicker than it will take for you to manufacture back in that country. Generally, I'm a free trade guy, and if the goal is to get to low tariffs with some of these countries, I'm all for it. But but with China, I consider them to be the great existential threat of the West and of America, and I totally and completely support what Trump is doing with China. The Trump tariffs on China, um, and there are issues uh, to some extent with, with, with China, the Trump tariffs on China are a tax on the U.S. Uh, middle class. Um, Ford is going to be laying off close to 12% of their workforce, as a function of these uh, steel tariffs, you have uh, a lot of uh, smaller companies that are looking for exclusions to these steel tariffs that make uh, pipe fittings or whatnot. Uh, the Trump administration, uh, because they have big donors who are uh, major U.S. steel manufacturers, uh, have denied every single one of those waivers. You see it with Iowa farmers who are paying uh, stand up to about $620 million worth of, of cost to Iowa farmers. So from a middle class perspective, I think the tariffs are, are damaging them. There's some benefit in the new NAFTA to, uh, some, to uh, some auto workers, but it codifies the uh, monopolies by Big Pharma uh, by uh, forcing uh, these monopolies on Canada as well. And really, you know, look, the number one issue that the middle class is facing is health care. And that's why we see every uh, uh, election across the country, we see Democrats running on health care and Republicans pretending that they're not signed on to the lawsuit that will destroy some of the most popular elements of the Affordable Care Act slash patient protection uh, bill. So um, maybe we, we could turn to that where it'll be a little bit. Yeah, I mean, the trade, I think we, we can agree on part of it and disagree, but let's talk about health care. Um, first of all, the Trump tax cut also included a repeal of the individual mandate, which was the largest tax on our generation. And if you don't believe it's a tax, just read John Roberts' opinion that upheld Obamacare. It is a tax on people that do not need to necessarily buy health insurance by force, and were being forced to buy something that was completely out of their income bracket. But, but in health care in particular, there have been bill after bill that would have lowered premiums, 
that would have allowed health insurance to be bought across state lines that have been opposed bitterly by Democrats and some Republicans because they're bought by the health insurance companies. Um, and I would be much more on the, on the side of that we need to actually have a market in healthcare. And we have anything but a market. We have an, oligopi an oligopoly controlled by a consortium of health insurance companies that are in bed with the pharmaceutical companies. I agree with Sam that are also in bed with the regulators from the FDA. Um, and so you can kind of see a constant theme um, in healthcare and higher education in particular, which are two things I talk about a lot. The reason why prices continue to skyrocket, in my opinion, which Sam will totally disagree, is an inside-out relationship between the, the entities that are raising the prices and the entities that are controlling those markets and the government regulators and government institutions and government politicians, where you actually allow a market to happen and you, you, you deregulate and you allow competition and entrepreneurs to cut prices, that will, that will end up, that, that will change quite quickly. There have been probably a dozen uh, waivers for uh, in various states across uh, where insurance companies can sell across states. They don't do it because their risk pools, they are much more comfortable in dealing with markets they know. When they go into other states, they lose money. And that's why they don't do it. The idea that there's any inhibition for uh, insurance companies to sell across uh, states, by, there is no federal law that says that they can't do it. Each state has their own insurance regulators. That is not a federal so law a whatsoever. So they have the tried state. it time and time again. The risk pools are different. They cannot make money. That's why insurance companies don't do it. What is going on now is 20 Republican states are suing the federal government because of that small tax that was the individual mandate, which incidentally has risen the cost of premiums by almost 15% since Donald Trump has taken So it office. proves that young people were subsidizing this backwards health care system. It proves that our generation was being taxed that's to pay. Right. Oh, okay, so it's that's insurance. right. So our, our, our generation has to pay more for something we're not going to get. Well, you don't know that you won't get it, right? Now, if the Republicans have their way, you will lose your pre-existing conditions um, if you have. That is not correct, Sam. That is 100% correct. The bill that was and that was not that was voted down. Bill, I'm talking the lawsuit by 20 Republican states that is not being defended by the Trump administration DOJ. If that lawsuit, which is not being defended by the federal government that has the law, is successful at the Republican-controlled Supreme Court. If you have pre-existing conditions, you can be denied your health insurance or you can be charged through the roof. If you're 26 or younger, you cannot be on your parents' thing. You will have lifetime caps, you will have yearly caps. You will not get essential benefits. You will not get your free colonoscopy. You will not get your free mammogram. Nothing is free, Sam. Stop saying that. Nothing's free. I mean, it's some, some, someone down, some you taxpayer, someone is paying for it, Sam. Tax I mean, come on. supported mammograms or your colonoscopies. And we will end up paying even more because nothing is free. We pay yes. as a nation. Just said free colonoscopy. Or, well, yeah, Charlie. So taxpayer funded colonoscopy would be so, a better way to put it. Are you paying for the microphone? No. But you're, no, they're paying me to be here, so we're, yeah. Okay. Look, the bottom line is yes, when government provides you services, it collects tax, and that's the way it pays for it. Pay for the uh, way it's paid for. It is far more efficient to have a single payer for health insurance than, than the private insurance industry, in part for the reasons you mentioned, in part because there's no profit uh, off the top. Um, but for those reasons, we should probably have a single payer health insurance program in this country. So, but um, I, I hear this argument a lot, and I'm hearing you imply it that somehow somehow a market stops working as soon as it goes into healthcare. Is, is that something that, I mean, well, it, it works in food, it works in housing, it works in technology. Well, it doesn't Prices work go down, in quality goes up. It doesn't work in housing. It doesn't work well. in housing? No, we have, Gener you said yourself, we have, we have how many homeless do we have in this in the Yeah, country? because California has excessive environmental re regulations. Well, are there no very hard to build houses. Is there, in Texas, are there no homeless? Yes, in Texas, they're far more deregulated than in are California. They, do they have homeless people? Of course, but far less okay, than in the right. state of California, And Sam. do they have far Section less. 8 housing in Texas? I'm sorry? Do they have Section 8 housing in Texas? Yes, but again, they okay, have far less than in the state of California. Okay, they have more homeless? Of course. 
So in housing, we see the failure of the private market. We see it certainly. Okay, so homeless, homelessness is not a failure of the private market. Countries. Here's the thing. So the, the 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 idea is that somehow if you eliminate profit from health, that, that health, profit should not be involved in healthcare. That's that's right. Okay. Not not only is that. So, you would say food is essential to health to, to living. Why 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 not have government subsidized grocery stores? We do. Oh how. We, Sugar, corn, um, wheat. We, we pay farmers not to grow. It's the opposite of, we, we literally we subsidize, subsidize inactivity. We subsidize we not subsidize producing. We subsidize all of these products. To, to tell, to, we, we subsidize farmers not to produce. In 1972. Of which, uh, and by the way, Richard I bitterly Nixon's oppose subsidies. Here's, here's the point. Commerce is a market, Secretary. no matter where a market is allowed to be in active, whether it be in healthcare, any sort of sector, you, you, you will always see Prices go down, quality go up, and more people have access to it. I know you're. Th those laser, are the principles I, of a market. But they the don't stop working is, because you implement. We them don't in have healthcare. a choice if you need health care. LASIK eye surgery is elective. Wait, so some, someone who can't see and might be blind that gets LASIK that's somehow elective, because LASIK LASIK eye surgery is dealing with one of your vital organs. It takes someone with a high high special specialization degree. It's yet elective. Uh, again, well, sight, sight might be elective to you. You're wearing glasses, but I wouldn't say that's necessarily elective. But, 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 so, but, it, but it requires a special, specialized technician, surgeon, doctor. And so it, it's not any less important. Here's the thing. There's two different things. There's health care and there's health insurance. Two right. totally different things. We have, very, very, we have the best health care for those who can afford it, correct? How do you, how do you expand access to something and get the price down. A market. It works in everything, Sam. It has failed in We this don't country. have a market in healthcare. We do not we, we limit the amount of doctors that go into healthcare every single year. We have a national doctor quota that the American Medical Association what? lobbies for. I know you never heard of it. You should you should Google it. Because it's what we have in this country. We have a national quota of doctors that the American Medical Association, the American Medical Association how many, only allow a how certain many amount of doctors. Do we have per doctors, in the, or how many doctors per patients do we have in this country? Enlighten me. We have what, one to a thousand, is it? No, I'm asking you, enlighten me. I think it's close to one to one. So, so when you have more doctors doing something, therefore you're gonna have more competition in that pool, which would bring down prices. And by the way, th far speaking of pricing. smaller ratio, far, far uh, larger ratio in the uh, other Western industrialized nations. And in fact, they spend far less on healthcare and have they better They pay it in taxes health. though. Sam, here's the thing. So, you, you commonly the Mercatus other study. You, you're familiar with the Mercatus study, yes? No, tell me what it is. Mercatus is. Well, Mercatus, I'm sorry, the Mercatus study. From, right, the Mercatus study. Which scored Bernie Sanders $25 trillion. $32 trillion. $32 trillion, 32 trillion right. It scored Bernie Sanders' single payer health care program at $32 trillion over the course of 10 years. It scored what we would pay as a nation for health care if we didn't do single payer as being $35 trillion. Yeah. Right, so, so your, your, your solution would then be to take that in taxes and to appropriate it for a single payer. That's correct. So I don't want to live in a country that has a 55 to 60% tax rate to pay for something that I'm never going to benefit here's from. Here's the problem you have. Uh, we'll, we'll here's, have here's the problem Charlie uh, uh, has. So oh, don't tell oh, me what finish. to do with my money Hold and on. take away 60% of my earnings Charlie to pay has. for something that I'm not going to benefit if from. If Charlie doesn't want to live in a country that appropriates his money to pay for health care for other people, he's got nowhere else to go except for maybe a third world country because every that, that single is, Charlie, other that, Sam, Western Charlie, industrialized country I'm gonna give you the last is word doing here. that for their citizens and they are saving money and providing better health care outcomes. With 50 Charlie to 60, the, last the highest tax rate, the ha highest tax rate in a country that Sam likes to talk about a lot, Norway, is 78%. That's not a country that I want to live in. And maybe it is. Maybe this that, that, country that's a conversation. had 90% highest tax rate for 30 years during the... That's the marginal versus time. effective, Sam. You know there's a difference. Do not yes. demagogue it. What's marginal. The, explain to the audience marginal versus effective. You just demagogue something. What's marginal versus effective? Marginal tax rate means that for every dollar... Okay, so, right, so it wasn't the effective. That's the difference. It's, it's effective tax rate in Norway. It's a difference. Well, the effective tax rate was probably about 80%. It, it was it was it was 38 percent. Then it went up to 44 percent. You just say Listen, go. The tax rate, the tax rate, 
This under is the final point. the tax rate. Under Dwight D. Eisenhower, went all the way up to 90% on the, on the, on the effect of nothing. Every market. dollar after $400,000 was taxed at a 90% rate. That would be at about $2 million a year now. And so the marginal tax rate, you can work it out. We have such incredible wealth inequality that when you're talking about some of the billionaire funders that we might know, or the, the effective tax we rate. Have, we're not getting into The effective that. tax rate is going to be quite high, maybe 85 percent. Okay. Yes, gotta, I, I love billionaires that created up. millions of jobs and wealth for all Americans. I think we should applaud those. Okay. People. All right. So we're out of time. We're 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 out of time here. But I actually thought that was a very constructive debate.